My name is Roger Annas. I live in Vancouver. I'm a member of the Vancouver Eco Socialist Group. And uh, we're part of the a system change, not climate change network that exists in North America, which is a, an anti capitalist um, movement for action on climate change. And uh, I came to the issue of oil by rail because I did a lot of writing about it in the past year. And uh, so when the social forum was, was called, and uh, I was following uh, both uh, what uh, Bruce's writings at the CCPA were doing and also what the Réseau Eco Socialiste in Quebec are doing on the issue. And so uh, it seemed very timely for us to do a forum here at the People's Social Forum on the subject. Now, I think you notice in the program, we also had uh, an invite to be here with us today from Carré Bleu Lac Megantic, which is the community organization in Lac Megantic that's dealing with the consequences of the disaster and working flat out uh, for the past 13 months on the consequences of the disaster. And his doctor said, slow down. <laughs> and so um, he sends his regrets. He would very much like to be with us. And hopefully we'll have other events like this uh, in this part of the country where uh, Jonathan and others from Carré Bleu, Lac Megantic will be present because unfortunately um, this issue is not going away. So we have two presenters with us uh, today. I don't even have to introduce them because their names are there for you to see in print. But Bruce Campbell is the executive director of the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives and he's the author of two very important reports on uh, Lac Megantic, including the one I mentioned from just three days ago now. And Alejandra Mendez is the recently uh, elected coordinatrice of the Réseau Eco Socialiste, which is uh, kind of based in the Quebec Solidaire uh, party and movement in Quebec, but which also reaches uh, beyond that. So they're each going to give us uh, approximately 20 minute uh, presentations, and then we'll uh, follow that with uh, questions and discussion. And I'm going to give you a brief introduction of the uh, oil by rail issue uh, that I hope will um, help our. Um, uh, discussion overall. Uh, let me ask, is there anyone here from Lac Megantic? And is there anyone who lives beside a rail line and sees them all the time going by their back door? Okay, Alejandra. Uh, I spend a lot of time in a part of Vancouver which is getting oil by rail traffic coming from North Dakota uh, up to the small refinery that we have in the city and also we have a small oil uh, export terminal in Vancouver. So. Um, I don't live beside the rail line, but I spend a lot of time there, and I know intimately the people who do live beside that rail line who are deeply concerned about this issue and what it means for them, because as you'll see, this is uh, sprung upon us. That's the incredible rise of oil by rail. The chart on the left are the, um, the movements of railway uh, wagons of crude oil, not refined oil, because you'll see on the US chart there, next to nothing uh, up until about 2000 and eight, nine, and then that sharp rise. So that's just crude oil. That's not refined oil. There was already lots of refined oil moving on the railways. And then on the right hand is the chart for Canada. Now Canada, Statistics Canada doesn't separate crude oil from refined oil. So the figures you see there for Canada, which those are just annual monthly selections, the month of January and all those years that you see. And so what you actually get in the Canadian figures here is the sense that there is, there has been lots of oil moving on the railways in Canada, but what's taken off is crude oil. And the other thing that's important and distinct about that is these now move in entire trains. Before, typically refined oil is going to be five, ten cars and a hundred car uh, uh, train. Uh, but when you start moving entire trains of uh, fossil fuels, uh, in this case crude oil, then you're dealing with something entirely different. So. And it's interesting to see how much oil comparatively is being moved in Canada. We're only a tenth the population of the United States, but we're, uh, our railways are moving uh, more than a quarter of the quantity of oil <coughs> compared to U.S. railways. And also one other note, the figures there in the U.S. don't include Canadian railways. So CN and CP are very active in the U.S. in moving oil. So U.S. figures just, uh, at least in, in this case from the AAR, provide just the figures for the movement by American railways. So. So there you have it, the massive rise of crude oil by rail movement uh, beginning really big time in the year 2010. And I think this is why it's happening. And there's, I think both of these sets of reasons are important to, uh, to keep in mind. We have an economic system that doesn't know 
how to control itself, basically. There's no limit. I mean, it's all about uh, making money. And so the, uh, the quantity of uh, crude, crude oil by rail movement has no limit as far as what the economic system and the, those that uh, uh, profit and operate it would do. And then there are some very specific reasons of why uh, this increase is, is happening now and why it didn't happen 10 years ago, for example. Um, so this is why we're seeing this expansion take off so much. Now this is the sort of major oil pipeline network in North America, and there's lots and lots of other smaller ones, including going to the East Coast, but this is the big volumes of, uh, of crude or conventional oil movement that happens in North America. And so you'll notice uh, what, one thing that's common to a lot of the areas where oil is produced in North America is it's landlocked. If it's going to be exported, it has to get to the ocean somehow. And so we in British Columbia, and I think you're very familiar with a pipeline called Northern Gateway, uh, which is hugely controversial. And the other BC pipeline, in this case an expansion of an existing line, is Trans Mountain, which is also pictured on the map here. Of course, here you are in the path of another tar sands pipeline that's proposed, which is Energy East. And I understand there was a session just before this one uh, attended by an awful lot of people for reasons that are understandable uh, about, about that. So that, you know, could potentially be another line that's not indicated here on the map. This must be uh, an older study. It's from Statistics Canada, but uh, it does show the proposed Northern Gateway Pipeline, but it doesn't show the proposed uh, Energy East Pipeline. But, but still, the point is just how much landlocked things are. And so look at the capacity that rail gives to oil to move. Now, you've, now you're on every coast. And there was even a proposal to move to, um, oil up through northern Manitoba to, to uh, Hudson Bay. Thankfully, that proposal has recently been canned by the company that was making it. They decided for their own company reasons, not for any environmental reasons, that they won't do it. But otherwise, you see um, the access to uh, the coasts, in plural, of North America is quite extensive with rail. So rail opens up a whole new ball game for uh, the oil industry that is landlocked for these different reasons I cited before. People have concerns about pipelines. You need to go through regulatory processes with pipelines. With rail, it's still the wild west. And so, uh, hence, the expansion, the rapid expansion by rail that can't be done so rapidly with, with pipelines. And so in that railway network, this is largely uh, uh, showing you a network of the, you know, the most the busiest rail networks where the most maintenance is done on the track and other systems that guide how the railways work. But then you come down to the smaller lines like the infamous one that led from Montreal, the line that is that leads from um, uh, Montreal to St. John, New Brunswick, which is roughly the historic Canadian Pacific railway line built in the 1880s. And CP sold this line off. It took them a long time to persuade and cajole the federal government to let them to do it, but they, uh, they finally sold it off in the early 1990s. And so since then, uh, I think three, maybe four owners of this line have taken it over and just done the bare minimum on maintenance and, uh, and then begun to move oil on this line. In, uh, I think the first train movement was 2012, not much more than a year before the disaster happened in lac So, um, and we know the, um, what this produced in Lacrimagontic. This is coincidentally Google Earth just, I don't, I guess they have satellites where they take, they happen to take the image of uh, southern Quebec just a couple of days after Lacrimagontic. It wasn't done purposely, this, you know, because the satellite goes around the Earth and it takes images as it goes. It just happened to be there. And so this is the image of Lacrimagontic, um, the disaster, just a couple of days after the fires were put out. So you see the extent of the devastation there at that point where the the railway line um, comes into the town and then diverges. And then there, this Lac-Megantic was by no means the only oil train disaster that's taken place with the rise of crude oil. So this is a couple of months, uh, sorry, one month before Lac-Megantic, uh, the Bonnie Book Bridge, which is about a 100-year-old CP rail bridge over the Bow River in Calgary, basically cracked under the weight of these oil trains that uh, were running across it. In this case, uh, luckily, no oil escaped into the river. Uh, this was Castleton, South Dakota, just before a bit of a New Year's Day awakening, I guess, for the um, 
the residents there. This is the, oil, the infamous oil from North Dakota in, in the case of this train, the highly volatile oil that was being carried in Lac Megantic as well. Um, this West Virginia, uh, similarly, um, uh, carrying North Dakota oil, caught fire, some of it escaped into the river. Luckily, the train here didn't go the other way because those buildings you see is basically the story of Lac Megantic, people leading their lives on a typical day, and then an oil train, boom, goes off the track. In this case, uh, you know, it was not the um, disaster it could have been, but I, I remember reading a newspaper report where a cafe owner, probably in that building or one of them adjacent, said, oof, we dodged a bullet here because if it had gone the other way, it would have been a different story. Now, um, as the, the growth in oil train traffic ha uh, occurs, people who become more aware of this don't like what's happening. And so we are seeing a rise in a movement of opposition among people in North America saying, whoa, we don't want this stuff in our backyard. We don't want it in our towns or in our cities. And, you know, coincidentally, almost tragically, people in Maine were protesting on the very train line that comes into Maine from Montreal and Lac Mahantic. This is the month of June, uh, one month before the, the disaster, um, where one, this protest uh, took place. And then another one just uh, a little more than a month after Lac Mahantic, uh, this, this one here was actually on the MMNA rail line. This is on another one of these sort of rundown secondary rail lines. In this case, it goes from Albany up to St. John, New Brunswick, because St. John is where Canada's largest oil refinery is located. So basically, this rail line has the same lack of maintenance and poor state of uh, repair and all the rest as MMNA did. And so that's why uh, people in Maine are also focused on this. It's owned by a short line company called Pan Am Railways. Um, there's a, okay, so in this case, there, there is still a trial. Two people are facing uh, criminal trespass charges from this protest in August 2013. There's another trial going on of a different sort, which is the, uh, the trial of three employees of the uh, Montreal, Maine, and Atlantic Railway. And they had their, just their first opening um, uh, session back in May. Sorry, I forgot to put the date there. Um, that was in May 11th, I think. They had just the beginning of the trial, and then it's to resume in September, unless it's been postponed. I don't think so. Uh, so on the left is Thomas Harding, who was the engineer on the fateful night. And um, we'll see what the trial tells us. I don't jump to any conclusions here. I, I think there's a strong likelihood that what we're seeing is a show trial, that rather than you know, the owners of companies who decided to do this oil by train operation and then put it in motion and disregard all the safety concerns that we're going to hear about. but. We'll let the trial uh, tell us what we, uh, what we know and find out. Perhaps a lot of what was in the TSB report uh, two days ago would suggest that this problem is a lot bigger than whatever these three guys did in a typical day of work on this company, and that's what we'll find out. Certainly, by the way, that's what the people of the town of Lac Macantic think, because this, this trial event was in the town, and the newspaper reports at the time were universal. They said, uh, that is, they were, the newspaper journalists were talking to local people, and the local people are saying they've got the wrong people on trial. It should be the owners of all the consortium, of all the companies that put together uh, this uh, network that should be on trial rather than these three employees, or at the very least, in addition to these three employees. And indeed, some might wonder why these aren't the people actually also on trial, on the right or two of the uh, owners of Irving Oil, and I think you know the fellow who's sitting on the left. So here he is one month after Lac Megantic promoting Energy East and uh, all the supposed benefits that that's going to bring to, uh, to people. Um, I'll close on one point which is in the West, in the East as well, I think especially in the West, there's a very parallel development which is as important which is the movement of coal by train. It has the same serious environmental consequences. Why are we digging up and dig uh, burning coal just like oil when the world needs a rapid shift away from that? And then there are specific uh, safety concerns with coal trains. It's roughly the same as exists with oil trains. I mean, these, these things don't explode, but they, they create dust that's very hazardous to anyone within probably 1,000 feet of the, uh, the rail lines and, and so on and so forth. And we actually had a coal train uh, that um, derailed in, in, within Vancouver, and it dumped into a, a, a creek system that leads into an important lake in Burnaby and then eventually into the Fraser River, so all this stuff. So. Um, you know, they're not inconsequentially environmental concerns here either. Uh, so this is one of my favorite placards at a uh, 
uh, uh, protests against coal trains that we had last year in Vancouver, because they want to, they will actually want to expand the export of, of coal in Vancouver to make Vancouver a doormat for the coal industry. And so these are some readings you can do on oil by rail. Bruce's two reports are um, indicated here. And uh, you may not want to write down the long URL. You can just go to the CCPA website and, and find it in the, um, I think it's called publications. Yeah, publications reports. You'll find um, both of these there quite easily. And this uh, video by Vice News is quite informative. It's actually set in the Pacific Northwest. That is Washington, Oregon, where it's a huge, that's one of the places where oil by rail is really uh, taking off. But it's a very good video to give you an overview of uh, the issues involved with it. And then uh, I've done a lot of writing, but also I put a lot of um, the writing by other writers, including, including Bruce, uh, but many others uh, on a web page that I have. So you're welcome to look at that as well. So I'm going to stop there. And um, we're going to hear from our guests, uh, our panelists. Um, the first, first, as I mentioned, is Bruce Campbell. He's the author of this report that came out three days ago on the um, uh, regulatory failure of the uh, of railways at Lac-Megantic. And so uh, would you please give a warm welcome to Bruce Campbell. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Roger, for organizing this and, and for inviting myself and Alejandra. Um, I think it's an, an important issue. It's certainly one that uh, is a hugely important issue. Let's not, uh, um, let's not downplay the importance. This is, this is a hugely important issue. Um, the bigger issue of uh, transportation of oil by rail um, and the context that you provided, but, but the specific issue of the, of the disaster of Lac Megantic, the worst rail disaster in well over a century. Um, and, um, you know, I, back in, um, when it happened, I was watching it to, like millions of other people and was just horrified uh, by those images. Uh, and, and I hadn't, uh, you know, at the time thought about uh, actually writing about it. Uh, I'm certainly not a rail expert. Um, <laughs> Uh, I've, I've had a fairly steep learning curve since I've I dived into it, um, but um, but I you know I'm, I've been in the public policy and uh, I've been a public policy analyst for pretty much pretty much my whole uh, career, so I do know something about public policy and and I've written before on regulatory policy, uh, and at the time. Uh, that the accident happened, I was reading a book which I, which I found, which really inspire, inspired me to dig deeper into this. It was a book by uh, Susan Dodd, who is a professor at King's College uh, in uh, Halifax. And she, um, she wrote a book called The Ocean Ranger, uh, a book about uh, the uh, sinking of that massive oil rig in the early 80s uh, in which 40, 84 men were killed, including her brother. Uh, and so it's been with her for all this time. She wrote the book in 2012. Uh, and it's just a, um, it's not a long book, but it's just filled with insight. And so that really gave me a frame uh, that was very useful. Uh, in doing my research and uh, my analysis. Uh, and so, uh, but later, uh, and I didn't realize this right away, but uh, my colleague Diane Touchette, who's actually here uh, with us today, um, lost three members of her family in Lac Megantic. So there was that personal uh, uh, dimension of it to keep kind of really keep the focus on it. Uh, what I knew about um, uh, regulatory policy was, um, was that it was prone to regulatory failure and that, uh, that criminal negligence or negligence on the part of corporations um, what would be the result. Um, and, and so let me just say, if you, before I get into the specifics of Lac Megantic uh, and the regulatory failure associated with Lac Megantic, just say something about just 
And there are people here that know a lot more about it than me, but it's been going on for some time, the deregulation uh, of, uh, of rail and other, and other sectors. Uh, in the case of rail, it uh, it's also um, goes by the name of self-regulation, uh, so that uh, to a much greater extent, uh, companies uh, have been uh, given the freedom and the flexibility to basically uh, set their set their own rules uh, with supposedly Canada Transport Canada approving them, um, um, uh, but um, but without the oversight and enforcement um, uh, that uh, they're, they're kind of meaningless uh, those rules and. Um, as I said, the regulatory policy is set at the top, whether for rail or for anything else. And this government, I'm not saying it started with the Harper government, but I think they've carried it to new, uh, to new levels. Uh, they, the, la the latest regulatory policy that, that was implemented was 2012. Uh, and if you've heard any of the rhetoric around uh, the Harper government and regulation, uh, it's always associated with red, red tape and red tape being a cost to, to business, and so, so therefore uh, kind of all of the momentum is, is with reducing red tape, reducing the cost of government. Of course, uh, you know, lip service to health and safety and environment, but uh, when you really get down to the real nitty gritty with the regulatory policy, that's what it's about. Um, and there are aspects of that regulatory policy uh, that are that go beyond where it was before. Uh, one of those, and I think it's really critically important, is the so-called one-for-one one rule, so that every new regulation that's proposed um, and to the central body, which is which is Treasury Board. So, if a department like Transport proposes uh, a, a regulation, there has to be, um, along with that proposal, has to has to to be the reduction of another regulation or the administrative burden associated therewith. So, so that's, you know, that really puts a ceiling and it kind of sets a tone uh, for the approach to regulation. And although, as I said, in, and I've talked to people on the inside at Treasury Board, and so although in theory issues of environment and the community interests and the, the, the benefits of a regulation are also considered in effect it's cost of business and it's short-term cost. And, and on top of that, uh, as you know, this, this government has very tight control at the top. So very, any significant regulation or regulatory proposal uh, will not go through uh, without the Prime Minister's office uh, um, vetting it. So that's, the kind, that's kind of this, the broader setting of, of regulatory policy. Um, uh, you know, and, and, the, and the government, the government, as I said, sets the tone. It sets the, um, it, it hires the, the senior uh, officials. It, uh, it sets, in a sense, uh, the, the culture of regulation. It sets budgets. Um, and, um, you know, and therefore, you know, when I, in, in my writing, uh, well, the first report that I wrote back in October is where does the buck stop? And I basically uh, follow it all, all the way up to the apex of the, uh, of the uh, responsibility uh, pyramid. Um, so Roger has talked about the, pe I, I won't talk about the broader context of the growth, uh, uh, the, just the enormous growth in, in transportation of oil uh, by rail. He's, he's kind of laid that out. Um, and, you know, the regime that's in place uh, to regulate railways uh, is a, is a rule-based uh, regime. I think there are grounds for criticizing that. I mean, the companies basically set the rules. Transport Canada, uh, you know, approves them. There's supposed to be consultation. Uh, it's, it's either... Um, it's often um, pretty shoddy in, in terms of uh, uh, that, that consultation with, with the union, consultation with communities. Um, but, um, but, but that, is, you know, I mean, legislation and real regulation uh, 
following that process is a much stronger form of regulation. This is uh, a weaker form. It gives uh, uh, much more power to the companies. It really tilts the balance uh, for companies. And, you know, after all, companies are in the business of making profits, uh, of improving shareholder value. And by the way, shareholder value has been skyrocketing for the big railways uh, in the wake of this uh, petro boom. <coughs> Um, but that's their, that's, you know, that's what they're um, authorized to do or, or mandated to do. Um, and so you, you can expect when there's a compromise between uh, issues of conflict of interest uh, or issues of uh, costs or profit making and public safety, there would be, uh, 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 there would be those compromises uh, that, that, that would be made. Um, so, anyways, that's the regime that in, that's in place. But if you've got vague rules, and if you've got many exceptions to those rules that are granted through an uh, opaque uh, process, um, and if you have, a, as I said, a cozy relationship between the regulator and the regulated companies, and you have, as uh, has been pointed out by the Auditor General, uh, most recently in 2000, last, sorry, November 2013, but uh, two previous Auditor General reports uh, uh, and the TSB report now that there is, uh, you know, a, a serious uh, lack of uh, lack of oversight and enforcement. Um, you've got the ingredients for regulatory failure, and and a company then uh, like uh, MMA, which uh, which was prepared to take advantage of the rules, a company operating on on the market on the margins, uh, cutting costs, cutting staff. Um, uh, you've got you've got an accident that uh, that is waiting to happen. When I, um, I I I did the first report over over the summer. It was what I did on my summer vacation in 2013, and and then I, and the report came out on in, in October 2013, on the very same day that the Mike Duffy scandal broke, which was uh, not good timing, but. Uh, uh, you know, people, it got around. Uh, this time, uh, I, I had planned, I was on my vacation and I thought, okay, I'm gonna write something because it was time to write something. I knew the TSB report was coming up. And, uh, but I was, I was saying to myself, well, you know, write it um, uh, after the TSB report and just see where we are in September, October. Um, but I, the more I, uh, saw that the government was in real denial uh, about its role. Um, a number of occasions, uh, the Minister of Transport uh, uh, said that it was, uh, you know, it was the, it was negligence of individuals uh, and not regulatory gaps. Uh, and said that a, n a number of occasions, and she was obviously testing the waters because she said the very first thing in her press conference after the TSB report. That was the first thing sh she said, that, uh, that it, it vindicated Transport Canada. Uh, uh, they didn't follow the rules. And no, no, um, no acknowledgement of any kind of responsibility, no acknowledgement of even what was in the Transportation Safety Board report, which was, you know, use the metaphor you want, either the regulator was asleep at the switch or they were operating with their eyes wide shut or, or whatever. They, um, there was no acknowledgement of that. But, but, in the, uh, but when I saw that, I thought, oh, uh, this, is, uh, this, is a, this, is, this was my trigger to actually write this report. And, uh, and it was a real scramble to get it out. I got it out a day before. Uh, and you know, it tr turned out to be better timing in terms of uh, attention that w that was paid to it. And I think, you know, one of the one of the reasons I, I wanted to get it out before was to to give journalists and 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 the general public and um, and opposition critics, uh, whatever, just a a, a frame uh, in which uh, they could they could ask questions and compare and it, it, it provide a counterpoint to uh, uh, to um, to what was the report that was going to come out or the spin that the government was putting on, putting on and so that's 
that's that's what I did. Um, willful blindness was was the report, and and I document, and I've largely uh, largely used uh, media reports, some less obscure than others. Uh, um, some some uh, was a little more difficult to find, but I also was uh, uh, used the uh, testimony before the transport committee, and uh, you know the, there has been a transport committee investigation going on, not specifically on Lac Megantic, but uh, but uh, that was certainly the trigger for that investigation. It's a tightly uh, uh, controlled, politically controlled committee. Um, but there was some really good testimony, in, including from the Union of, uh, of Transport uh, Workers, uh, whose president is here today, and her colleagues. So, so thank you very much. Your testimony was, and, and your brief was incredibly valuable to me, and you'll see it reflected uh, in, uh, in my report. And uh, so I, I did have some uh, access to some insider sources, but for the most part it was, uh, uh, material that was on the record, and I, I document or I summarize um, uh, multiple uh, multiple uh, areas of of regulatory failure, uh, and and you know you know one or two regulatory failures is one thing, but the number that I've documented would suggest, and it it begs the question for me is that, uh, you know, was this a case of willful blindness? Were they, you know, were their eyes wide shut? Were they looking the other way? Uh, and so that is kind of the, the that kind of provided the, uh, the, the title uh, for, for the report. Um, now, I was also a little concerned that the TSB report would not go far enough. Uh, and that's, it's a, it's a, you know, a reputable, Body, I, they've been working on this uh, in investigation for for over a year. We'd per, we'd get uh, important new information, but it's limited in scope as to attributing uh, uh, responsibility or blame. Um, so it, it and and going beyond. I mean, I asked the question: How far up the chain or the pyramid of responsibility will it go? Will it name names? Who made the decision? Uh, well, I'll get to that. Who made the decision to uh, uh, to go with one person uh, cruise over the objection of so many? Um, so, I mean, I think you have to also uh, acknowledge that it's not a truly independent uh, body. It's uh, it's uh, the board members are appointed by the government, and this is a government that has really politicized things. And so, you know, the, these were kind of cautions uh, about the report, and my sense was that it, it wasn't going to be the last word. And besides, there are different, there are other investigations going on. Within, uh, within Transport Canada, there's a criminal investigation into the transportation of dangerous goods. Uh, apparently, there's an internal investigation into, uh, into the decision making around, uh, Around the one-person cruise, but I, you know, nothing. There's been nothing reported or nothing com c completed there. There's also the civil suit. Now, the civil suit uh, has lots of defendants, or over 50 of them, including Transport Canada, and maybe that's why. Maybe that's why trans the the minister is not inclined to say, you know, make the simple admission. Yeah, we failed. We failed. We failed. The people of Lac Megantic, and they paid the they paid the price, and will try to do better, you know. And she's, you know, in fairness, they've taken measures very quickly in 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 the in the aftermath, in in the wake of this. Have they gone far enough? No, but but it's the it's the accident itself, and it's the failure uh, of of uh, of the regulatory system. Uh, where you know a simple admission of, of uh, responsibility, I think, would be would be nice and refreshing. Um, so I, I mean, I document a number of areas of regulatory failure. I'm, I'll go in. I'll go through some of those. I'm not sure how much time I've got left, but uh, but uh, ten, ten minutes. Oh, that's more than I thought. Okay, and, and let me start with, um, with the, because I think it's the most significant one, or it's the one that I spent a lot, it's not the, I shouldn't say that, I won't say it's the most significant one, but it's, 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 it's striking. Uh, single person crews. Here's this, 
this company allowed to operate uh, these massive oil trains um, with just one operator. Um, and this, it was known before Lac Megantic, there were warning signs about the, the, the explosiveness of this oil. But going back at least to the, uh, perhaps further to the fall of 2011, where, where regulators in the United States were raising alarm bells about this, uh, about the, the volatility of, of, of that oil. The regulator itself uh, in the United States had, uh, had expressed uh, concern about it. Uh, when it when it happened, um, you know, and, and Transport Canada uh, or the officials, uh, the senior officials said, "Well, we weren't aware." They said they pleaded ignorance, but I don't know. I I think uh, they had, as regulator, they had they had a, to have a responsibility uh, to be uh, to be aware uh, of the of the contents, the transportation of dangerous goods directorate. Um, the senior officials, uh, the director generals, the ADMs uh, for, for uh, uh, safety and security, uh, those responsible should have been, should have been aware. Um, you know, as Roger mentioned, uh, they really started carrying this oil in November of 2012, and between November of 2012 um, and, and, and the accident, they carried 67 trains, about 4,000 tank car loads of this back in oil, very volatile oil. And, and so always on the manifest, it was, it was in a low volatility c category. Um, but when Irving sent the empty cars back, uh, you know, they, they labeled them with a higher volatility, PG2 as opposed to PG3. Um, so and I think, I, I have to think that they did that because of the, the residue. Was Transport Canada, did the transportation of, of uh, dangerous goods uh, uh, directorate, did they inspect at, at the, did, did, did Irving inform Transport Canada? Did Transport Canada go there to approve it? Don't forget, the Transportation of Dangerous Goods Directorate has 35 inspectors. They haven't changed as far as I know, it's still at around 35, unless they've they've hired people in the in the last few months. Uh, but uh, as of November, and and maybe when uh, when the union testified, there was there was about uh, uh, 34, 35. I know they've brought some over now to from from the airlines. But uh, you know, to that many uh, that small a number of inspectors uh, for. Um, you know, for the, the the enormous increase in the transportation uh, of uh, uh, of of these dangerous goods, and so I made the simple calculation uh, using uh, the the number of carloads and the change from 2009 to 2013, and then the number of inspectors. Made the calculation, pretty simple calculation. It's picked up a lot. So one inspector for every 14 cars in 2009. One inspector for every 4,500 cars in 2013, with the with this growth expected to be exponential. So by next year or 2016, we could triple, quadruple. Uh, the 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 uh, you know this is according to the the estimates. Uh, uh, you know it's just uh, it just it's just staggering. But you know in in the case of of of, of Irving. You know, was there any contact? Was there any uh, communication? Were they aware that this was happening? Um, it, it didn't clarify for me, at the, and I haven't really gone through it really carefully, the TSB report, but I, I certainly haven't seen, seen that. Um, back to one-person crews, so that's where I started. Um, in, in 2008, there was some, there's the, uh, at the behest of the Railway Lobby, uh, the Railway Association of Canada, they put a rule in called General Rule M. Um, and I won't read the rule, but what it did uh, is it gave um, the, the freight rail lines permission uh, to uh, operate with one-person crews. So they didn't have to go back and, 
and, uh, and, and get a formal exemption or formal exception from Transport Canada. And, and that, was, that's called, that was called General Rule M. I, it's, it's, in my, it's in my report. Um, and that was, that was at the behest, and the, that's what the, the railway lobby was proposing. Uh, Transport Canada approved that, and it was shortly after that that, uh, that MMA uh, went ahead with the first part of its plan to operate with one-person crews. Um, and it, it, it did that um, uh, in starting, I guess, in 2010. Uh, so it operated between Maine to Lac Megantic, basically uh, mostly through unpopulated areas. But but I, I believe it went about a 23-mile run to just I think to Nantes, and then and then uh, two-person crews from Nantes, um, um, uh, you know, to to let front to Farnham or wherever the end of its line was, um, over the objection of the Montreal office. Uh, of Transport Canada. Uh, it had a terrible uh, record of safety violations, uh, and yet, um, you know, no, it, didn't, it had a, a safety management system on paper, as the TSB noted, but you know, they didn't even look at it until 2010. So, you know, it was there on paper, but many of the employees didn't even know it existed. Uh, but anyways, they got permission. They they didn't. They got probably informal go ahead, or at least it wasn't blocked by Transport Canada for the first stage of that. Even though, even though the um, the Montreal office said, you know, they don't have a proper risk assessment. It's a joke. It's a it's not you know it's just a Mickey Mouse uh, r risk assessment, uh, and and yet they went ahead. And so uh, that was that was stage one. They, came, they went back in 2011 for the second stage. Uh, and again, the Montreal office was really uh, opposed to this. And there's lots of documentation. Uh, I recommend the documentary that Enquête uh, uh, in, in, for Radio-Canada did on this. It's just, just a really, really good uh, uh, documentary. Uh, and so, um, so they went back, and again, the Montreal office uh, ob objected. Uh, the union was in negotiation. The union representing the workers, the steel workers union, objected. They were in collective bargaining at the time. Um, and so then we have on record the, the, the CEO of this company um, approached uh, the, the lobby and said, look, these guys are giving me, putting all kinds of obstacles in, a way, in the way. And the, the, the lobbyist said, uh, let me make a few calls. So then, then the wheels started turning, and not that long after, um, MMA started um, basically in July, I think it was, of 2012, it started operating with one-person crews over the objection of, uh, as I said, uh, a lot of people, and it, without a proper consultation with the communities. Now, it may have talked to some of the mayors, but it didn't talk to all of them. The union said it didn't talk to anybody. Uh, the mayor of Farnham was categorical. Uh, so, you know, operating with, uh, with uh, one-person crews uh, was, um, uh, you know, just a, a disaster with a, with a train like that. Um, there, the, I'm, I'm, I'm noticing I've got a, a time call. So um, let me just say in the, in the last few minutes I have is, is that the, an, another uh, factor that needs to be considered was the poor condition of the track. Um, and there is uh, lots of reporting of this and lots of documentation. Um, there are strict uh, prohibitions, uh, on speed pro prohibitions, uh, and, uh, and they could have prohibited the transport of dangerous goods uh, on a track uh, in, that, in that poor shape. Um, the Transportation Safety Board, as I said, has documented uh, the lack of oversight, the lack of enforcement. Uh, uh, it has, um, unfortunately, I think, and I, my information is, uh, is the following, uh, that it has fudged a bit 
uh, the role of one person trains as a contributing factor uh, to this accident. Um, so there have been some changes in the report and it's no longer considered, it was at one point considered in the writing of the report, considered a contributing factor and now it was pushed over to a, to a risk factor. Um, uh, but I think it, uh, it, it is central, is central uh, you know, it, it laid out 18 uh, contributing factors. Uh, that should have been, that should have been uh, in there. Of course, the contents of the, of the train uh, I've talked about, uh, lax testing standards, uh, the unsafe tank cars, uh, a lot has been said about those cars. Uh, that's definitely uh, a, a factor. Um, in, in conclusion, I, I mentioned, let me just say that I, I think, don't think this is the end of it. This is not the last chapter with the Transportation Safety Board report. Uh, there are lots of unanswered questions. I posed uh, I, questions in my report, uh, uh, many of which aren't answered. Um, we don't know what went on uh, inside Transport Canada, why that, that uh, why that it, uh, w that, that it didn't block MMA, given its, uh, its uh, atrocious safety record. Why those violations and breaches were not uh, met with uh, penalties and sanctions. Um, is it because they weren't there or because the will wasn't there or was it some combination of, of, of those? Uh, those, are not, those are questions that, that really haven't been answered. And, uh, and so what I've called for um, what uh, I understand the opposition, uh, the official opposition has called for, what I know Unifor has called for is, is I'm not sure about, uh, uh, about the union of uh, transport workers um, or transport inspectors uh, has, is calling for, but, um, but, but there is a, a groundswell, I think, of, uh, of voices that are are saying that we need to get we need to get to the bottom of of the regular uh, of the regulatory failure and the and the negligence of the industry, the power the enormous influence and power of the of the rail lobby of the industry itself, uh, and we need to get at the bottom of this if we are going to make fundamental changes to the to the regime to the regulatory regime. Uh, and if we don't get to the bottom, it's, in my view, it's a prerequisite. Uh, it's not, the, it's not uh, everything, but uh, without it, I think uh, you know, communities through which this, um, this uh, oil uh, are not going to be immune to another um, uh, corporate uh, or, or disaster. And, you know, as I said, it's the worst disaster in over 100, 100 years. Uh, and there's no reason, in my view, a lot, there are other comparable accidents uh, that have had this kind of uh, independent judicial inquiry to be able to hold people accountable, to call witnesses. And uh, so that's my, that's, the, that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh donc, euh, je me représente. Mon nom est Alejandra Zaga. Je, suis, je fais partie du réseau écosocialiste au Québec. Euh, je suis également étudiante à la maîtrise en économie écologique à McGill. Donc, ma présentation d'aujourd'hui porte, euh, on peut commenter la tragédie, tout, euh, même rejoindre certains points que Bruce a nommés euh, auparavant. Donc, je me base sur un texte de réflexion dont nous avons écrit tout de suite après la tragédie en plus également d'un peu nos travaux de recherche en économie écologique. Donc, euh, tout d'abord, euh, qu'est-ce que c'était cette tragédie-là en termes matériels? On parle le 6 juillet 2013, on a 72 wagons, comme on a, on a vu dans les photos, qui déraillent dans la municipalité de Lac-Mégantic. On parle d'une municipalité de 6 000 habitants, une région écœurante, une région super belle. J'ai déjà eu la chance de faire du camping, puis promener là, euh, c'est euh, on parle là, c'est la rivière euh, chaudière dans la chaudière Appalaches qui a euh, absorbé les 10 000 euh, litres d'hydrocarbures qui ont été versés. Il y a 47 personnes mortes, 37 bâtiments qui ont été détruits au centre-ville, tout comme on a vu. Donc j'ai rejoint Bruce là-dessus. C'est une des tragédies les plus euh, grandes qu'on a, immenses qu'on a vues dans les derniers siècles. 
Euh, puis en plus, cette semaine, on a un peu entendu parler euh, le retour sur, euh, sur les, les événements et, et on parle des rapports de, du bureau de sécurité des transports et ainsi euh, un, un, un excellent rapport du CCP qui malheureusement n'est pas encore en français, mais la version anglophone est, est super pour vraiment comprendre les liens entre de, la déréglementation, la négligence des compagnies et aussi les rôles du gouvernement. Moi, ce qu'aujourd'hui, je vous offre comme, comme réflexion, c'est aller un petit peu plus au-delà pour comprendre cette, euh, cette tragédie puis les conséquences dans un contexte euh, tel comme le Canada, dans un contexte d'une économie extractive, une économie néolibérale et capitaliste, et on peut voir les liens entre les logiques, euh, un peu les dynamiques économiques et politiques à l'intérieur euh, de, notre, de ces systèmes et comment on les voit un peu présentes dans cette tragédie. Donc, pour moi, de prime abord, il faut comprendre que dans l'économie euh, canadienne ou même nord-américaine des, des, des pays occidentaux en ce moment, on vise euh, sur la rentabilité des entreprises. On, la rentabilité, euh, la définition, donc, c'est la réduction des coûts de production dans le but d'accroître les profits. Et ça, c'est comme la loi de base de toute euh, entreprise qui a comme but l'accumulation du profit et la récréation du capital. Il y a un économiste euh, dans les années 50 qui s'appelle Cap, je travaille beaucoup là-dessus euh, dernièrement, qui, lui, il définit cette logique de la rentabilité comme étant la cause de ce qu'on appelle euh, les déplacements des coûts. Là, en anglais, c'est « the cost shifting practices ». fait que les entreprises, elles sont poussées dans le but d'accroître euh, la rentabilité, de diminuer les coûts. On n'est pas… Euh, puis on a des exemples, on va les nommer dans le cas de Mégantic. Et ces coûts-là, ils existent. On ne les a pas effacés. Ils sont de, de facto déplacés vers le public, vers le gouvernement, vers les communautés, vers les écosystèmes. Donc, en fait, comprendre qu'on euh, ne peut pas juste faire disparaître ces coûts-là, ils, ils vont être assumés par quelqu'un d'autre au moment donné, dès la chaîne de la production, dès la chaîne de la distribution. Donc, euh, dans le cas, on parle d'une compagnie privée, la Montreal Main and Atlantic Rail Railway, pardon, euh, firme qui est aussi à filiale de Rail World, une firme internationale, et qu'ils ont aussi comme but, euh, pendant toute son historique, de pousser pour la privatisation du système ferroviaire, donc toute cette transformation faite par une entreprise privée, et la responsabilité également des coûts repose sur les autres. Donc, comme je disais tantôt, la négligence dans, ces, dans les cas qu'on va voir elle provient du phénomène des déplacements des coûts, et, et que ces coûts-là, par la suite, ils sont assumés par des personnes qui ne sont ni, euh, ni actives dans le processus, ni de production, ni de distribution, mais pas non plus, euh, non plus, elles ne bénéficient pas ni des retombées. Ils sont nulle part dans la, dans la chaîne de production. C'est les personnes qui sont mortes, les personnes qui vivent cette tragédie-là, n'ont aucun emploi en lien avec les transports ou euh, c'est vraiment des gens, des gens à l'extérieur. Et c'est ça qu'on va définir aussi comme les, les injustices sociales et environnementales. On voit dans les cas des mines, dans les cas de, de, de l'exploitation d'hydrocarbures ailleurs, c'est le même cadre qui se répète. Donc, euh, comment on a fait ce déplacement des coûts? Euh, la, cette compagnie elle a décidé d'économiser 4,5 millions et miser sur l'efficacité en remplaçant ses équipes de travail euh, par des, des appareils de contrôle à distance. Donc, ça, c'est une, de, une des choses qu'on peut voir. Euh, après, les, quand ce qu'on disait, c'est les... les L'opérateur, le seul opérateur présent, ça c'est une autre diminution des coûts, euh, laisser les trains sans, sans surveillance pendant la nuit, il y a eu des manques de formation des employés, des nombres insuffisants d'inspections de la part des Transports Canada, c'est toutes des choses qui n'ont pas été assumées et qui augmentent les risques et les pertes. Et en plus de ça, on a un gouvernement qui applique la même logique. C'est pour ça qu'il faut comprendre le rôle des gouvernements néolibéraux et des gouvernements euh, dits aussi euh, extractifs. Parce que dans leur logique interne, ils vont viser vers la même chose, la réduction des coûts au sein du gouvernement et socialiser les risques et les pertes. Donc, euh, j'ai beaucoup aimé quand Bruce a dit euh, le déni, de, de gover, governmental denial, euh, donc un double déni, un déni de ne pas assumer leur responsabilité depuis le départ, mais lorsqu'il y a une tragédie telle qu'elle, ils n'en ils sont, sont plus non plus leur responsabilité par la suite. Euh, puis, une des choses qui est importante là-dedans, c'est le rôle des dérégulateurs que le gouvernement Harper y a fait, y, y, y vit. Puis euh, même, c'est une, une tendance avant Harper, les libéraux, puis une tendance 
général, on peut, si on va dans d'autres pays autres que le Canada. Donc, qu'est-ce que c'est la réglementation? Dans le fond, c'est un État qui encourage l'investissement, encourage la place d'entreprise privée, les échanges économiques en réduisant les règles sociales et environnementales. Donc, l'État euh, devient facilitateur, donc il soutient le secteur privé, il devient distributeur, donc il, il essaye de faire les, les liens, euh, surtout par des, euh, comme on appelle les, les partenariats privés et publics, donc il distribue euh, des contrats. Il est aussi compétitif, il joue un rôle d'être compétitif, les états sont compétitifs dans le sens, tout comme une entreprise, ça adopte la même logique, et euh, tout ça amène une réorganisation de l'économie, je pense qu'il y a une des plus grandes, euh, la révolution d'Harper est beaucoup basée là-dessus, de restructurer l'économie pour permettre la, un peu euh, la récréation de, de ces cycles-là. Et tout ça, dans ce, on voit en plus, puis je pense qu'on l'a vu avec les exemples, qu'on sacrifie euh, la démocratie, donc on met de côté les consultations populaires, on met de côté les lignes depuis le, temps, depuis le début pour assurer l'hégémonie des secteurs d'affaires euh, au détriment des territoires, au détriment des populations. Fait que ça, c'est dans le contexte dans lequel plus euh, global que cette tragédie se passe. Euh, encore une fois, la création, on voit la création des injustices sociales et environnementales. Je pense que l'explosion du lac Mégantic, c'est quelque chose de très ponctuel, puis très comme in, in our face, comme on veut, là. Euh, mais c'est quelque chose qui se passe à tous les jours, euh, qui, au niveau environnemental, et qui s'attend au-delà de juste le transport euh, par train. Donc, une autre chose qu'il faut comprendre, au, à part le rôle d'État et de milieu libéral et euh, la logique euh, des entreprises, la rentabilité, qu'on est même dans la main dans un système qu'on appelle euh, extractif. Un système extractif dans une économie extractive comme le Canada, et historiquement, est une économie extractive, ce n'est pas quelque chose de nouveau. C'est ça quelque chose qu'il faut euh, un peu comprendre, que le Canada, c'est basé comme une colonie, basée sur l'extraction, la fourrure, après c'est par les bois, ou même on a joué un rôle euh, au niveau de l'extraction agricole. Euh, c'est toutes des choses. Et maintenant, c'est beaucoup sur l'extraction d'hydrocarbures. Et c'est là-dessus qu'on mise, et c'est pour ça qu'on voit l'augmentation des transports par train, où là, on pousse vers les pipelines, pour continuer euh, cette machine extractive. On définit une économie extractive, c'est une économie qui se base et qui repose sur l'extraction et échange des ressources naturelles euh, pour créer des, la, pour, pour, euh, ce qu'on appelle le relancement économique. C'est une économie qui dépend des stocks, donc des, qui dépend des ressources non renouvelables et qui, les seuls buts, des dépendances des ressources non renouvelables, c'est de croire et faire rouler les flux financiers. Donc, euh, dans le but de, de juste correspondre aux, aux intérêts privés, surtout sur les intérêts privés. Donc, au Canada, on voit de plus en plus, euh, puis on va encore voir ça avec euh, l'augmentation des, euh, des transports en train, on mise sur des énergies extrêmes, très les sables bitumineux, les tar sands, euh, les gaz de schiste, les, les gaz, euh, excuse-moi, les pétroles de schiste en Anticosti. Donc, on voit une augmentation de, pas seulement du pétrole brut tel qu'on le connaît, mais en plus avec des énergies extrêmes, et ce qui est soutenu par le gouvernement au niveau de l'investissement, mais aussi au niveau des de réglementations, comme tu disais, des one-on-one -on -one rule qui permet à ces gens-là de continuer l'exploration, de continuer l'exploitation des transports. Euh, après, on encourage bon, toute, la, toute la question des pipelines, je ne rentrerai pas en détail, mais une des choses qui nous a plus frappé quand on a vu ça, on était vraiment dans le moment que la ligne 9 euh, commençait à être poussée, qu'on poussait pour avoir une, une pipeline au Québec. Et les, une des unes, en fait, c'était au, au Star, je me souviens plus, c'était un, un journal à Toronto qui disait euh, « Québec strategy proves » que « pipelines are better than trains », quelque chose comme ça, que ça est plus sécuritaire pour nous autres, les transports par pipeline. Mais il faut comprendre, c'est qu'au au rythme de développement du Canada, il va voir les transports des trains n'arrêteraient pas, ne va pas arrêter. Ça serait juste être complémentaire au, au transport euh, par oléoduc, car le but, c'est vraiment faire sortir le plus possible les, euh, les résultats des sables bitumineux d'Alberta. Donc, euh, je vais sauter là-dessus parce qu'il y a aussi autant de coûts entraînés par euh, les pipelines, parce qu'on compte 804 déversements, par exemple, en Amérique du Nord, de la part d'Ambridge, de, euh, de qui est la compagnie mandatée 
pour faire cette publique dans l'Ouest, dans l'Est. Dans le cas du Québec, ça, je veux juste faire un peu aussi comment l'État du Québec y est aussi <rire> main dans la main dans, le, dans la logique extractive. Les trois partis euh, principaux au Québec, ils ont dans leur agenda des, euh, des politiques extractives mises en place. Le dernier gouvernement dit plus progressiste, le gouvernement du Parti québécois, il a mis de l'avant euh, l'exploitation du pétrole de schiste en Anticosti. On a une contradiction parce qu'on est une des provinces qui a signé les plus euh, euh, dans leur discours, puis même des, des engagements pour réduire les gaz à effet de serre, mais en même temps en encourageant l'exploration et l'exploitation des hydrocarbures non conventionnels et en même temps en permettant euh, la construction des pipelines. So, on, est, on est dans la même log logique. Et en plus de ça, le Québec comme le Canada, euh, il est à, à, à cette, euh, comment je peux dire, à cette euh, virée extractive, on est accompagné, accompagné des politiques d'austérité. Fait que les politiques d'austérité, il faut prendre en considération dans tout ça parce que ça vient avec la réduction des coûts. Donc, même logique appliquée par le gouvernement, pas seulement dans le cas de réglementation environnementale, mais dans tous les secteurs publics. Fait que qu'est-ce qu'on, les, les gouvernements se lavent les mains, ils déréglementent, ils réduisent les coûts, fait que la coupure dans les dépenses publiques et, en même temps, il dit on va se baser sur l'exploration et l'exploitation des ressources euh, naturelles comme le pétrole, d'une façon désespérée pour accroître euh, les, les poches de l'État. Mais ce qu'on voit, c'est une accentuation en fait, de la crise écologique, parce qu'il n'y a pas assez d'argent pour couvrir euh, les risques environnementaux, mais étant donné qu'il y a eu des coupures et les services publics ne sont pas prêts un peu, à, euh, à prendre ces fardeaux-là. Non, dans ce, ce côté-là, le Québec et le Granada, on est dans la même culture extractive, la même culture, ce qu'on appelle un capitalisme pétrolier extendu. Euh, je ne sais pas combien de temps. How, how's my time? Parce que là, j'ai une autre section, mais je ne sais pas. Tout. OK, j'ai encore cinq. Donc, l'extractivisme, l'extractivisme et euh, est -ce que, est -ce que, le capitalisme, on les connaît se base sur une mauvaise compréhension euh, de l'économie et de l'écologie, euh, comme on, on, il s'est perpétue en croyant que euh, les, les ressources sont renouvelables et en misant que sur l'accroissement la, des, des flux monétaires et des flux financiers. Donc, il y a une notion un peu d'irréversabilité, euh, pardon, de réversabilité. Donc, on croit, par exemple, euh, dans les politiques euh, actuelles que si on met certaines règles après une, un, un dérapement, ces, euh, ces conséquences-là sont réversibles. Il faut comprendre que beaucoup de conséquences écologiques et sociales même ne sont pas réversibles. Et tant autant euh, que l'on ne comprend pas les flux écologiques, donc avoir une compréhension de comment notre terre marche et comment il euh, y a des ressources qui ne vont jamais se renouveler, mais pas seulement ça, c'est que... Euh, les flux matériels, ce qu'on appelle les flux financiers, n'agissent pas de la même façon que les flux matériels et énergétiques. Donc, on a vraiment une déconnexion. Et, euh, et ceci fait en sorte que plusieurs euh, politiques environnementales, euh, sous ces régimes extractivistes et capitalistes, ne font en sorte que comme mettre du maquillage autour du bobo euh, à s'attaquer aux symptômes, mais pas à la à cause euh, des problèmes. Donc, euh, je voulais un peu commencer à conclure sur qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire en se basant sur, si on se base sur, euh, euh, sur cette tragédie et d'autres, parce que ce n'est pas la seule, puis ce n'est pas les seules euh, tragédies écologiques que nous avons vues et nous allons voir. Donc, je pense que la première étape, et là, je rejoins un peu l'intervention euh, euh, des gens du CPA, c'est, oui, il faut demander une réglementation, une responsabilité des entreprises, mais il faut être conscient qu'en augmentant la réglementation ou c'est basé en ayant des entreprises plus responsables, nous ne sommes pas en train de remettre en question les statu quo. Nous ne sommes pas en train de remettre en question les systèmes extractivistes dans lesquels toute cette dynamique est basée. Donc, je pense que c'est une opportunité d'aller au-delà et de questionner les euh, régimes pétroliers d'Harper, de, de questionner vraiment les systèmes euh, dans lesquels on roule depuis... Euh, euh, depuis le début euh, euh, du capitalisme. Donc, pour nous, ça, je, je partage un peu la réflexion de mon collectif. C'est pour nous, c'est une, une, une opportunité de penser à quel autre type d'économie, quel autre type de relation avec les ressources naturelles on veut avoir pour sortir de cette dépendance au pétrole, de ne plus avoir ce type 
des, euh, des tragédies. Comment, nous, euh, puis là, je, je vous partage une, une, très brièvement, de continuer à s'opposer à tout nouveau euh, projet d'exploitation, d'exploration et de transport, euh, avoir une solidarité avec les autres luttes qui existent, pas seulement les luttes environnementales comme dans ce cas-là, mais toutes les autres luttes dans lesquelles on veut freiner un peu l'expansion de ce système. Euh, et plus important, commencer à repenser et encourager des alternatives de production, surtout énergétique. Et, et là, les, les, plus grands, euh, les plus gros défis euh, et qui devraient, pas, bon, en tout cas, je ne veux pas me lancer là-dessus, là, mais comment penser à un autre projet qui, pour nous, euh, qui peut être ni écologiste et en même temps anticapitaliste, écologiste et en même temps anti-extractiviste. Donc, euh, pour conclure un peu, puis j'aurais d'autres choses à dire. Je crois que l'accident la, euh, du lac Mégantic ne pourra pas être juste résolu avec les rapports qu'on va avoir de la part du, du bureau, bureau de transport et de sécurité. Et nous, on ne peut pas juste se baser sur les accusations individuelles et les fausses promesses de sécurité. Et on ne peut pas juste réduire ça à un problème technique, mais plutôt structurel et économique. Il faut repenser euh, au rôle de ces énergies-là dans notre économie et comprendre également le rôle de l'État néolibéral et extractiviste. Donc, pour nous, c'est une opportunité de, de questionner et de réfléchir au-delà. Merci beaucoup.